As Tom mentioned, I'm an assistant professor of wildlife ecology at UAF, and I specialize in the human dimensions of wildlife science. So for, for you folks that may not be familiar with that field, a researcher of the human dimensions of wildlife often studies the interactions between people and wildlife and the thoughts and behaviors of people toward wildlife. The people that I spend most of my time studying and collaborating with are hunters, and the wildlife species that I tend to focus my research on is large mammals. <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in how and why in interactions among hunters, large mammals, and habitat change over time. And when I think, at least in my view, when I think about the interactions between uh, hunters, large mammals, and habitat, as Tom mentioned, I think of them as hunting systems. And if I was to just maybe describe the structure of a hunting system to you, the first thing I'd need to do is tell you a little bit about each one of the key components of a hunting system. But if we wanted to take it a little further and understand the function of a hunting system, I would also have to tell you how each one of these interacts. If we want to ideally sustainably manage these systems, we not only want to know the interaction amongst these components, but how these interactions change over time and why. What are the drivers, the stressors, the causes of change that is uh, uh, changing these interactions? So tonight, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to tell you a few stories that I hope enhances your understanding or at least piques your interest temporarily in how both environmental and human-caused changes in habitat are affecting interactions between Alaska's wildlife and hunters. So our roadmap for this evening, it's a three-part series. I'm, we're going to begin up north and talk about bowhead whale hunters uh, in northern Alaska, and then we're going to go a bit farther south, talk about warming landscapes and moose hunters in interior Alaska. Then we're going to finish down in beautiful southeast Alaska, and we're going to talk about the relationship between logging and deer hunters. So for this first part, uh, sea ice and bowhead whale hunting, I need to give you a little bit of background information. This study was part of a larger study uh, that tried to address how climate change is affecting the availability of subsistence resources that rural hunters depend on. I think most of the folks in this room would agree, and probably across Alaska, that our future climatic and ecological conditions are going to be a little bit different than what we see now and what we've seen in the past. And I don't just say that because it's been raining the last couple of days. I had these slides put together before that. I say that because the landscape around us is Train changing in a fairly profound way, melting permafrost, big changes in sea ice extent and concentration, and we're getting a shift in the wildfire regime. So I was interested in this large, larger study to understand how these changes are affecting the availability of the local resources that subsistence harvesters depend on in rural Alaska. And I italicized and underlined availability for a reason. When I say availability, I mean something specific. To me, a resource isn't available to those that want to use it unless three things come together, abundance, access, and seasonal distribution. Let me explain. First of all, you need enough of the resource to be able to sustain a harvest, right? So abundance is very important. But equally important is people's ability to get out to the areas that they harvest that resource. And when you're working with a particular mobile or migratory resource, such as bowhead whale or caribou or waterfowl, you also uh, need to think about the seasonal distribution. It has to be in the right place at the right time. If all three of these things come together, that resource is truly available to those that depend on it. So as part of this larger study, uh, we work with the communities of Fort Yukon and Venati in the Yukon Flats of Interior Alaska and Kaktovik and Wainwright on the North Coast. And when we first started to work with these communities, we wanted to make sure um, that they found some value in our work and we wanted to make sure that they engaged in what we we're doing. So we went into those communities and we asked them to select the resources that we would evaluate during this study. And here's the resources that they selected. Moose, caribou, doll sheep, bearded seal, beluga whale, bowhead whale, and then a variety of fish and waterfowl species. So after we got a good handle on the species that, we wanted, that they wanted us to study the availability of, the next thing we wanted to do is have these really rich and interesting discussions 
on their perceptions of how their environment has been changing, specifically how envir uh, climate-driven environmental variables have changed in the past, what they're like currently, and how they anticipate they may change in the future. So we talked about temperature, growing season, freeze-thaw date, fire vegetation, hydrology, sea ice, wind, precipitation. And after we had a good idea of kind of the local perception of how things were changing, we then brought in our instrument-based science and showed them what we came up with of how uh, the weather around their community has changed and how it might change in the future. And what was really cool is that we are almost in perfect agreement on how things are changing and how they might change in the future. And that allowed us to move forward together and use both the local knowledge and our instrument-based science and combine that with the availability of uh, each of these resources. So the idea then was to take these changes in the environment and ask them, how are these changes affecting the seasonal distribution of the resources, the abundance of the resources, and your ability to get out to the resource, your access to the resource. And I'm going to jump right into the results um, to show you kind of uh, the take home message from this slide is <coughs> this access thing right here. So we looked at 19 different species in these four communities and we looked at positive, negative, and no change in the availability caused by all those different environmental drivers that you saw on the previous slide. Now what was interesting to me, if you look at the effects of climate on distribution and abundance, there's a few species that are expected to change in positive ways based on local perceptions, a few that are expected to have a, a negative change in seasonal distribution because of environmental changes, and the same for abundance, a, a couple positive, a couple negative. For the most part, based on the relationships that we identified through working with these communities, there's not going to be a super significant change for the majority of the subsistence resources because of climate driven effects. But what was striking is the number of species that are affected, that are expected to be affected negatively by climate driven changes with regards to access. Their ability to access re these resources seems to be a relatively vulnerable part of this system. So the next logical question is, well, how are these climate-driven changes affecting access? Give me some concrete examples. And this is when we're going to go to the bowhead whale and the hunting. I think this is a really good example of how some of these environmental changes are affecting people's ability to get out on the land and harvest resources. And we're going to go up and we're going to talk about some of the work with the community of Wainwright. I don't know how familiar everybody is with the bowhead whale here. Um, but it's an incredibly important species to many of the communities on the, on the North Slope, both nutritionally and culturally. Um, some of the biology on this species, this whale can get up to 75 to 100 tons, up to 20 meters in length, or roughly 66 feet. And uh, a couple interesting facts on this whale, it has the largest mouth of any mammal. And the other interesting thing is it is one of the, probably the longest living mammal that we know of. It lives to be at least 200 years of age, maybe longer. This was a relatively recent finding about this longevity, maybe within the last 10 years, which has uh, uh, made this species particularly interesting amongst the medical community. So where is this whale? Well, it mainly lives in Arctic and subarctic waters. The yellow here is the wintering grounds. In the spring, it begins moving up the coast right through here. It then summers in the eastern Beaufort Sea, and in the fall, it begins its migration back south along the coast of northern Alaska, heads over here to the east side of the Chukchi Sea, follows the Russian coastline down back to its wintering area. Right here is the community of Wainwright. So traditionally, they've mainly harvest bowhead whales in the spring. And as far as abundance of this species, it's kind of a success story. Since commercial whaling ceased, uh, this whale population has been increasing exponentially around 3% a year, at least since the 70s when we've been able to get sound estimates of the population with some precision. Now this is kind of a busy graph, but let me uh, take it apart for you. Over here on the x-axis is the abundance estimates for bowhead whale. 
Here is the whale harvest for the community of Wainwright. And on the bottom here is year. So we're looking at abundance estimates and whale harvest from the 70s to 2010. The X's are your abundance estimates. The solid line is fitted to those abundance estimates. The most recent one that I could find is around 17,000 whales increasing exponentially. These black dots are harvest by the community of Wainwright. Despite this increase in abundance, you can see that the harvest increased with the increase in the whales, then stabilized, and it's decreased in recent years. So what's going on? Well, it has nothing to do really with harvest restrictions. Um, the restrictions or the, the harvest regulations on whale have been relatively liberalized, and they've stayed the same or increased over the years. What this relates to, this decline in harvest over the recent decade, has to do with sea ice. Many of you are aware that sea ice is declining. <clears throat> this graph shows the extent in square kilometers of sea ice, Arctic sea ice, since 1978 to 2013, and this is for May. And I put May up there just because it's kind of the peak whaling season for the community of Wainwright. And as you can see, there's been a steady decline over time. And that's not just for this month. A couple years ago, this issue uh, really made front pages where in September 16, 2012, uh, the smallest ever Arctic sea ice extent was recorded. This yellow line represents the median sea ice extent for the last 30 years or so in September. And this white here represents what it was that year. So there's some pretty significant declines both in the extent of sea ice and also in the thickness and concentration of sea ice. Well, okay, so why does this matter to bowhead whale hunters? Well, let me tell you a little bit about how <coughs> they hunt up there. Wainwright, as I mentioned, they hunt in the spring. And what they do is they hook these small skiffs or boats to the back of their snow machine, and they pull them out to these leads. Leads are just these open stretches of water in a field of sea ice. And they get out there, and they try to find a safe, strong landing to set up camp, and then they launch their boats. They go out, they hunt these whales, and then they tow them back to these landings, pull them onto the sea ice, butcher them, and then take them back and share them with their community. Well, <clears throat> in recent years, because of the decrease in sea ice extent and thickness, a lot of the hunters I was working with talk about how these declining uh, sea ice concentrations and thickness, they're having to spend a lot more time just searching for a landing that's sufficient to hold the weight of the whale to pull it up. Not only that, they're talking about stormier weather with more wind and more erratic conditions of these leads. So when they're out there, some of these leads are opening up wide, being more vulnerable to these winds and these storm events, and they talk about these conditions that can be unsafe for whaling. We looked at some of these thresholds in winds and storms, and we found that over the last 30 years, they've lost about 25% uh, of their window for whaling. So about seven days due to high winds and storm events. And here's a couple quotes from a couple of the whalers that I work with that kind of summed it up well. It seems like our storms are keeping us from whaling, so our supply, in essence, is dependent on the weather now. Sometimes we have lots of open leads, lots of water to use, but too much wind, lots of whales, but we can't get to them. The water's too rough. So this isn't an issue of abundance. It goes back to that larger study that I showed. Changes in environmental conditions are challenging their access to get out to these resources. So what do you do? We can't control the weather, right? We're not going to control the sea ice. And if you can't mitigate what's causing the problem, you have to adapt to it, right? And that is what they're doing. In October 2010, Wainwright hunters landed their first fall whale in living memory. And in 2013, they did it again. And I'm not sure last year, but they may have done it again soon. So they switched their entire system around to concentrate on a different time of year to adapt to these challenging environmental conditions. So they used to mainly spring whale because that's when the whales were coming closest to the community. Now they're investing in different gear, bigger, more seaworthy boats, and attempting to go out and do some fall whales. So let me now take you down to interior Alaska. And I should say from the beginning, we're doing a bunch of research on this right now. So this is kind of developing, and we got some qualitative ideas of how things are changing. 
Um, I would love to hear at the end of the talk if you guys have more ideas, but I'll just kind of throw them out there to uh, uh, perk your interest in some of this stuff. Well, as I mentioned already, things are warming. Over the last 50 years, the annual average temperature has increased by around 3.4 degrees in Alaska. That's twice the national rate. And in the winter, it's been a particularly large increase. The winter average temperature has increased by 6.3. And over the next 50 years, the trend is expected to continue. The average annual increase uh, is estimated to be in between 3.5 and 7 degrees, and the winter average is expected to be in between 7 and 13 degrees. So what does this warming Alaska mean for our landscapes? Well, what we're already seeing and will likely accelerate is thawing permafrost. This is a picture of, taken by some hunters I work with in the community of New Wixit, up kind of near Prudhoe Bay. And I, I gave these hunters these GPS units with cameras, and I'm working with the community, and they're going out with these GPS units and taking pictures of interesting changes, kind of documenting change around their community. This is a picture of a lake shore where the permafrost melted and the shoreline eroded, and the lake and much of the sediment in the lake drained away into the nearby Colville River. And we're also seeing this play out in interior Alaska. It's especially evident in some of our river areas. And with this permafrost thaw in these river areas, what you're seeing is some bank erosion. In speaking to hunters and scientists that study the hydrology and the permafrost, we're seeing some unpredictable and rapid changes in the river channel and also some debris loading during odd times of the year. So what does this mean for moose hunters? Well, as I mentioned, we're kind of at the qualitative stage, but our hunters have, have helped us really understand how this might be affecting their ability to harvest the moose that they need. And one thing that they've talked about is how it's changing the navigability of some of these stream systems. Changing hydrology, they're also talking about some of these channels are widening, but also becoming shallower. So they're not able to get as far up some of these systems as they used to. The other thing that they're talking about, some of these channels that were, predict, that were connecting the main stem of the river to some of these lakes or ponds that they used to hunt are either drying up or getting blocked with debris. With regards to just the lakes and ponds, we're also seeing some drying. This drying is being driven by some evapor evaporation and this permafrost thawing that I was just talking about. So this is some work done by uh, Jennifer Rorden, a recent UAF grad up in the Yukon Flats area. So this is 1951, 180-acre lake. It is 10 acres in 2000. 1951, a 90-acre lake, it's four acres in 2000. So they're seeing some of these uh, lake areas being drying up. Well, how might that affect the hunter? Well, talking specifically to the hunters about this, it's not so much the drying itself, unless they used to hunt in that lake. It's what happens after the drying, and it's the, the boom and the abundance of willow that takes place around the shoreline. And what they've talked about, and we have studies right now, we're going out and documenting some of these areas to kind of better quantify how it's actually affecting uh, hunters and their ability to move across the landscape, but they talk about how it's causing some difficult travel and reduced visibility in these areas. And another no-brainer as far as warming Alaska is this shift in the wildfire regime. What we're seeing is an inc over time an increase in the area burned, the severity and the frequency of these fires. And this can be a big deal if it occurs near some of these communities. In general, fire is good for moose. It rejuvenates the area. It results in early succession forest, which is, uh, usually has an abundance of forage species that moose like. But for hunters, if this occurs in an area where they have much of their trail network, it can cause real problems with access. Here's a quote from one of the hunters that I work with in Venati. Some trails are so blocked off, and he's referring to a fire that occurred north of Venati about a decade ago. Some of the trails are so blocked off from the fire, they are hard to find. I figured that if we are ever going to clean it, our trail network, we are going to have to get an elder to show us where it was. It really burned. It's our access to our hunting area. So losing these trail networks, you may think, so what? But it's a big deal, especially if it's one of the main corridors to get them out to their hunting areas. It's somewhat similar to blowing up the exit to the Fred Meyer in an urban area. 
Here's another quote. The willows grow back fast. Right now it is over our head. That is how fast it grows. Since the 2004 burn, even the grass is tall, as tall as me. One interesting thing that we're trying to get at is how hunting opportunity changes following a burn. We know sometimes it can result in temporarily high densities of moose, but of course there's more than just abundance when it comes to hunting opportunity. And here's one more quote. This isn't on moose, this is on caribou, but it relates to the accessibility of these recent fires. I think the caribou know it. And when he says it, he means that hunters cannot move through burns easily. That is why they go in there. One time during a chase, they went into the middle of a small burn and stayed in there. I tried to get them, but there was too much deadfall. So the last thing I want to talk about with regards to moose and warming is the direct effects of warming on moose behavior. Now this, as many of my research questions, are led or driven by conversations with hunters. Hunters in recent years, because of some of these warm falls, have talked about how these warming temperatures is challenging the moose hunting. Moose are becoming less active, they're not going into the rut as strong, stuff like that. So we wanted to dig into this and look at how moose behavior might be changing to these increased temperatures. Because from earlier study, we know that a moose begins going into thermal stress at somewhere in between 57 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The higher stress usually occurs when they got good shade or there's high wind. But if there's no wind and they don't have any shade, temperatures as low as 57 can result in thermal stress. So the assumption here is that if moose are less active, they're harder to hunt. And hunters in this room would probably agree, which is why we kind of wait till that first frost starts getting things moving around. We wait till they go in the rut when they're thinking about something else, they're moving around and we can see them. We're a visual predator. They need to be out and active for us to see them, spot them, so we can put on the stock and shoot them. So we're just now kind of digging into this and trying to figure out if during these warm days, moose are changing the behavior and how that might relate to hunting opportunities. And I think it's a worthwhile effort. If you look at the traditional harvest season over the last seven years, when I say the traditional, I mean September 21 or September 1st through September 25th, we've had at least one day over 70 degrees during the last seven hunting seasons. All right, are you guys ready to come down to Southeast Alaska? Um, <clears throat> we'll come down and we're gonna talk about logging and deer hunting. I don't know how many folks are familiar with the uh, deer down there, but it's a Sitka black-tailed deer, Odocoilus hemionis sinkensis. It's, uh, it's a subspecies of the mule deer, a little bit smaller and stockier, and doesn't quite get the racks that your mule deer will get. Its range is fairly restricted to southeast Alaska and northern parts of British Columbia, and then a little bit over here by Ke Kenai Peninsula, and then on Kodiak. Well, in the early 2000s, hunters uh, began expressing concern that they were experiencing difficulty harvesting enough deer to meet their needs. And this is a big deal in southeast Alaska. Sitka deer are the most important terrestrial species with regards to sport and subsistence hunting. In some of the rural communities in this region, as many as 90% of the households use deer in one way or another. Well, this issue got pretty heated, and in the early 2000s, it was the number one game management issue amongst state and federal agency, ADF and G, U.S. Forest Service in Southeast Alaska. About that time, they contacted me and my supervisors here at UAF and asked us if we wanted to tackle this issue, and it had all my favorite things. It had hunters, it had large game, and it had some rapid landscape change. So we we're, and it was also a contentious issue, which meant it was important to people and it was worthwhile to address. So we got on board and we went down to study it. And the hot spot for this controversy was Prince of Wales Island. Located on the southern tip of southeast Alaska, Prince of Wales is the third biggest island in the United States behind the big island of Hawaii and Kodiak. Located within the Alexander Archipelago of the Tongass National Forest, the biggest national forest in the United States. Here's a picture of Prince of Wales Island on a blue sky day. They don't happen that often, but when they happen, it's, it's the greatest place around. What's also interesting about this Prince of Wales Island, it's also one of the rainiest places in the United States. I think there's one spot on Hawaii that's a little bit rainier. But the other thing that's interesting about Prince of Wales Island, since the 1950s, it has 
been hammered by industrial scale logging. Clear cut logging within this temperate coastal rainforest, and I'll tell you a little bit about this forest Sitka spruce trees, western hemlock, red and yellow cedar. I apologize about this slide. It showed up nice just a couple hours ago, but what you were going to see here is a map of Prince of Wales Island. And it was to illustrate all the logging that's taken place between 1950 and 1995. And then what it also showed was this yellow here, these roads that were constructed to support this logging activity, the most extensive road network in southeast Alaska. And like other things in Alaska, this logging has kind of undergone this boom and bust scenario. 1950s, you had explosion of logging. It maintained high levels for several decades. They were pulling several million board feet off of the island for several years. And then in the late 1990s, early 2000s, because of a decline in the market and also because of environmental restrictions, logging came to a crawl. So I was really interested to see how all this massive landscape change might be affecting deer and deer hunters. So the first thing I did is go talk to the hunters. I sat down with about 100, 100 hunters in all the different communities on the island. We conducted these uh, rich interviews to learn about deer hunting patterns and trends. And then at the same time, I did a GIS analysis to help me quantify changes in logging activity, forest habitat, and road access through time. So a, a little bit about these hunters. Most of them at the time I conducted this research were using their vehicles to access their deer hunting areas. About 23% were using a boat and the remainder were using a combination. I was also interested in what their preferred deer hunting habitat was. So these are the major habitat types on Prince of Wales Island. This muskeg here is a treeless, kind of poorly drained fenny, boggy type of habitat, clear-cut forest I showed you a picture of. It's when they come in and cut down all the trees in the area. Alpine is your higher elevation, treeless, windswept. It can have really good vegetation for deer during the summer. Old-growth forest, this is was relatively undisturbed by human activity. Beach and shoreline is, is self-explanatory. Your second growth is when your clear-cut forest uh, gets to an older age, around 25, 30 years old. And then pre-commercially thinned is when they come into a young second growth stand and they take out the trees that are less desirable, and I say less desirable for the economic market, so those more desirable species for market will grow faster and straighter. Well, I was interested, in, as I mentioned, in what was most popular amongst hunters for deer hunting. And amongst your vehicle hunters, which was the majority, they preferred clear-cut forest. They also liked muskeg. If you group all the hunters, muskeg was most popular. Alpine was also popular. So all three of these had something in common. They're all kind of more open habitats that you can see into. The least desirable habitats for hunting was these older clear cuts, the second growth forest, and your pre-commercially thinned areas. So I started to learn through these interviews with hunters and working with the biologists and studying the landscape myself, kind of the interaction between hunter, deer, and the land. And this is how I see it playing out. This is my visualization of an old growth forest. Some big trees, little trees, closed pockets, open pockets. Forest service punches in a road. Loggers come in, create their clear cut. Shortly after this clear cut, you have a boom of vegetation. A lot of these plant species coming back, deer like them. So deer move in and use these areas. Well, it didn't take hunters long to see what was going on here. They're seeing these new roads punched into previously remote areas to this nice open habitat with deer in it. So they used to mainly hunt the shorelines by boat. Now they're jumping in their vehicles, taking advantage of these roads and these new nice habitats that they can see into. So about two generation of hunters, if you think of a human generation around 25 years, these new clear cuts were be being created every year. New access every year. What a wonderful time to be a deer hunter, right? Happy days. Well, we know these clear cuts don't stay clear forever, right? So I was interested at how hunting changes after these clear cuts begin growing up. And here's what I found. According to the hunters I spoke with, the best hunting in a clear cut is when it's about two years old, okay? It's still real open, but you've got some vegetation coming back and the deer are moving in. It's good hunting from zero to eight years. But this, 
This is interesting. As soon as that clear cut reaches about 12 years of age, 86% of the hunters I spoke with said the area becomes unhuntable. And many of them weren't sure if you could hunt it again. So the background of this screen kind of shows you what roughly a five, eight-year-old clear cut might look like. Here's a 15 to 20-year-old. You can't walk through it, you can't see through it. I imagine it's pretty tough to hunt in it. And what I was going to show you on this slide, this again was the map, which was supposed to extend down here, of Prince of Wales Island. And I was going to show you the transition of this island from the 1950s to uh, 2000 of how this is transitioned into second growth. So going from a red to a green. So most of these clear cuts are now transitioning into that second growth stand. You are still seeing some new clear cuts being created but far less than there used to be. So going back to the thing or the concern that drove this study was this concern that hunters were expressing. And with this concern, they are also talking about increased conflict and competition amongst hunters. Well, part of what was driving that is you have a lot of these clear cuts being converted into second growth and these few clear cuts being available. And a lot of your hunters were all focusing in on the same clear cuts encountering each other, leading to more conflict, competition. As hunters in here can imagine, we don't like to see anyone else when we're out there hunting. So if we plot this change on a map, <clears throat> 1950 to 2010, if we plot, this is your, your clear cut, your managed forest, how good and poor has changed over time. Here's your young clear cuts, why there's a lot of logging underway. You had anywhere from 100 to 220 square kilometers of clear cut available on an annual basis in this good quality uh, time frame. Now, loggings came to a crawl, and what you're seeing is this poor quality clear cut habitat going off the chart. To add a little bit of insult to injury to these hunters, because there's very little logging going on, the Forest Service isn't bringing in much revenue from timber sales. So they not only don't have money to build new roads, they barely have enough money to maintain this existing road network. So at this time and over the last 10 years, they've been decommissioning many of these roads where they don't anticipate logging in the near future. And it's probably going to decline by about 50%. So you're not only losing access to your young clear cuts, you're losing access in general to all types of habitat, including your muskeg and your alpine, which are desirable. So we started to learn this relationship about the hunter and the land. But of course, in these hunting systems, we need to know what's going on with the deer, right? Well, there's, when I went down there, there was never been an estimate of deer population size on the island. So we really know, didn't know what they were doing. But sitting down with these hunters, we got so much good information, I thought, I'm going to ask the hunters. What have the deer populations been doing over time? So I put this graph, this piece of paper in front of them. It looked just like this. On the y-axis is the number of deer, and on the x-axis is year, 1975 to 2045. I put this sheet of paper in front of them, and I go, I want you to draw me a line. Tell me how the deer population has changed over time. And they're like, I can't tell you that across the entire island. I go, okay, okay, okay. Let's fine tune this a little bit. How many deer are in the area that you hunt? And they're like, oh, I can tell you. And they could give me a density estimate per square mile. And then when I said, okay, well, the area you hunt probably has a few more deer than the typical square mile. So let's drop that a little bit. And then let's just multiply it by the area of Prince of Wales Island. And that'll give us a starting estimate. I was more interested in how things have changed than the actual number. So that worked. So we got a starting number that we put on this map. And I said, please draw me a line from 1975 to this starting point, which is when I conducted the interview around 2006. And then draw me another line into the future, and I want you to tell me what the deer population is going to do and why. What do you think? You think this is going to work? Yeah. I, why not? OK. Here's what I got. <laughs> I was just getting into the human dimensions of wildlife during this work, and I learned valuable lessons on things that we should and shouldn't ask hunters. Hunters interact with a relatively small area. Some of them might be able to tell you what's going on at these massive spatial scales over this massive time period. But for the most part, they probably are more familiar with the area that they hunt. So all these lines may be accurate for the area they hunt. But I can't all add all these together go back to the area biologist there in Ketchikan and say, hey, I figured it out. There's somewhere in between 0 and 100,000 and 75. 
and they're either going to go off the charts and go extinct over the next 30 years. That doesn't help. So we can get rich information uh, using and working with hunters on some things, but for other things, we've got to use some of the more traditional biological tools. <clears throat> we could go back to the literature, and they've done work in the Pacific Northwest on how forage supply changes after a clear cut, and we know we have this boom of vegetation temporarily for about 20 years, and then from 20 to 200 years, 180 years, you've got very limited vegetation in your second growth, and then around 200 years, it starts converting back to your old growth forest characteristics, and the vegetation goes up a little bit. So kind of here's how this works with regards to forest supply. Here's your clear cut. Your second growth grows up. It's an even age stand with a very thick canopy, so thick that your sunlight can't penetrate through it. If your sunlight can't get to the forest floor, you're going to lose your understory vegetation. Those deer are likely going to move to greener pastures. But we know because the biological concept of carrying capacity, a certain area of land can only support so many animals. Over time, as the habitat decline, declines, likely the overall carrying capacity for deer on the island is going to decline. That's our working hypothesis, but you know what? We need some numbers on the deer and numbers on the deer over time to see what's going on for real. So here's just kind of a visual again of your younger clear cut, and then that's the same area when it converts into this second growth, this stem exclusion stage where sunlight can't get through. You have some mosses and some ferns in there, but really nothing that can sustain a deer for any long period of time. The other thing that we got to think about is these clear cuts. They may be real nice in the summer, right? What happens during a big snowfall? Well, a lot of these areas become unavailable to deer. They, they quickly push down the forage and that, uh, that vegetation is not available for the spring. And in some cases, these clear cuts can even be a cost. If the clear cuts separate two important patches that the deer likes to use during the winter and the deer has to move through these areas, it actually can be an energy cost. As soon as snow reaches about the brisket height of a deer, it has to exert a lot more energy to move through it. As much as five times, and this is especially the case when it's wet and heavy snow, which is exactly what you get down in southeast Alaska. If you've ever driven there, it only takes you about nine inches to get high centered. It's pretty interesting stuff. And really bad winters, if these deer are isolated in pockets long enough, they can eat themselves out of house and home. If they're in these pockets long enough, they eat up all the food that's available, and it's possible for pretty high rates of winter kill. Like this deer here, it's eating another deer that died right next to it. Do you guys buy that? You shouldn't. Deer don't eat other deer. I threw that in just for a little drama. I think it's eating kelp. It actually looks relatively healthy. But my point is, this does happen. And there's surveys done by ADF and G where they do these shoreline surveys because the tidal area keeps an area clean. They do these shoreline areas in the spring after harsh winters and they do find carcasses. It gives them an idea of winter kill. So I wanted to understand how all these changes in logging and these, these winters might be affecting deer population over time. Well, the first thing we need to do, we need to be able to estimate deer, right? Well, for caribou and moose, Aerial surveys work pretty darn good. They fine-tune them over the years. They can get a good idea of what's going on and how numbers change over time. But in southeast Alaska, you fly over this, you're lucky to see the forest floor, let alone a little brown deer running around under the canopy. So we had to come up with something different. And this is what we arrived at. Now you just see maybe a hand full of crap. But to me, this is my hand holding little libraries of information. Because what we learned is we could extract DNA from these deer fecal pellets and identify individual deer. Here's how it works. <clears throat> the deer eats some food. The pellet travels through the gut, goes through the lower intestine. When it's going through the lower intestine, these skin cells, these epithelial cells are shed on that pellet, right? They coat the pellet with their own cells. And we found that we could wash off this little DNA fill coating around these pellets. And from that solution, extract enough DNA where we could identify a deer and determine that this deer is different than all the other deer in the woods. It's pretty cool. It took us about a year and a half in the lab, but with DNA, we determined we could identify individual deer. We could determine the relationship between deer. We could tell how related this deer in this watershed was to this deer in this watershed, to this deer in this watershed. We could also identify the sex of deer. 
As you know, when you're trying to manage a game population, sex ratio is pretty important. So you can walk through the woods, pick up a bunch of pellets, and get an idea of sex ratio. Number of bucks versus dose. Well, this worked pretty good in the lab. That's one thing. How does it work in the field? Well, that was the next step. We went down and we established three study sites on Prince of Wales Island in these three different watersheds, and these are some of the communities. In each of those watersheds, we laid out these trails or these transects that we walked, and we made sure that these trails covered all the major habitat types. Your different types of old growth forests, your different types of clear cuts. And we would walk these things several times a year, anywhere from three to eight times a year. We would walk these things, sample some pellets, put it in a test tube. After we'd get some pellets from a group, we would clear all those pellets off the trail. And we would mark that trail really well. So when we came back, say, 10 days later, we could walk the exact same path. And because we cleared all the pellets, any pellet groups that we encountered the next time, we knew were deposited since we were there. So you take pellets out of there, you get DNA, identify the deer, and you know when the deer was there and where the deer was. Then we use some fancy mark and recapture st uh, statistics, and we come up with an abundance estimate. We did this for three years. We established 31 transects, and we collected just over 2,000 pallets. Pretty sexy work. Every day, three months a year, I would walk, stare at the ground, and pick up crap. <laughs> and the hunters would say, you must see so much while you're out there. And I'm like, I don't see anything. My head is looking at the ground nonstop. But I learned a lot about picking up little cues that are right in front of me, so I still thought it helped me a little bit as a hunter. <clears throat> so we'd put these pellets in a test tube, we'd preserve them in ethanol, bring it back to uh, Dr. Chris Huntermark's lab here at UAF, where we'd extract the DNA. We'd use these things called microsatellite markers. What these would do is isolate pieces of DNA that are unique among each individual deer. Think of these microsatellite markers as bookends. These little chemicals that go in and snip out the piece of DNA that we need to determine that that deer is different than all the other deer. After we do that, again, we can run some statistics and come up with abundance estimates and density estimates in these watersheds. And here's what we found. This was super exciting. For the first time for this species, we came up with an abundance estimate with precision. So this is our density per square kilometer in our three watersheds, maybe so staining, over the three years, 2006, 7, 8. So what we saw was a 30% decline overall across the watersheds over the three years. Like, huh, what's going on? Well, fortunately for us, biologists always like this, we had a good explanation of why this was occurring. And it had to do with winter severity. So this is winter severity indicated by snowfall in inches. Here's your inches. Here's year from 1970 to 2008. We did our study in 2006, 7, and 8. Here's the 50-year average snowfall plotted. As you can see, when we did these studies, it was the first three consecutive harsh winters in a row since the early 70s. And leading up to our study, we had three particularly mild winters, which may have allowed that deer population to get up and be particularly vulnerable to those harsh winters. So we had a good idea of what might be driving it, and there was some other data that we used to kind of reinforce our idea of what was causing this thing. Now remember, the other thing that we're interested in is how is this forest change? And how is logging affecting deer numbers? Well, we looked at deer densities in these different habitat types. And what we found is in your young clear-cut forest, we're holding about the same number of deer as in your undisturbed or unmanaged forest. What was striking, though, was your second growth. Again, once that second growth forest converts to the stage where it's not allowing sunlight to penetrate the forest floor, it was sustaining about half as many deer as the rest of the forest. So our hypothesis was kind of correct, that this logging over time, a lot of this forest converting into second growth, is likely reducing the overall carrying capacity of the island. So we are pretty excited about all this. adf and has since took our DNA-based technique and incorporated it into the monitoring program. And the U.S. Forest Service has paid attention to this second growth, and they're putting a lot of attention right now into managing this second growth, not only maybe to elevate deer numbers, but also paying close attention to what deer hunters like to hunt so we can elevate deer hunting opportunities. So that's my last slide on this, uh, this talk tonight, and I'm happy to field any questions or comments you might have. But before I do that, um, 
there's 40, 60 people that helped me with this study. And I've tried to be a good colleague to all of them, so I hope it's okay with them that I'm not mentioning all their names. But I do want to thank my funders, uh, the Resilience and Adaptation Program, RAP at UAF, NSF, NSF International Polar Year, National Science Foundation, the Scenarios Network for Alaska Planning, SNAP, it's also known as at UAF, UAF in general, the Forest Service provided a lot of support for that deer study, Institute of Arctic Biology at UAF, Bonanza Creek LTR, and of course, Alaska, Alaska EBSCOR for putting this all on and, and providing support for me personally. And then I worked with several good colleagues in ADF&G over the last 11 years. I want to thank them.